Good morning, folks. Um, how are we all today? Surviving the uh, insanity of being locked up at home, I hope. But that's okay. Today's session is um, Fast Track Technical Boot Camp on SBX. Um, I've got, I'm going to include image management part as part of this because in today's environment, particularly in today's environment with the uh, COVID-19 virus kicking around, we really need to be absolutely sure that things are happening and happening in the right manner. So I'm going to fast track a whole bunch of stuff here today, keep it short, sweet, to the point and deal with it from there. Um, if there are questions, folks, I will come back to the questions afterwards. Hopefully I will have covered all of your questions in the process. Okay, so um, I have two virtual machines here. They are mainly demonstration machines. Well, they are, that's the only reason these two servers exist. Um, they sit on top of a workstation here that I, this is my work laptop, which is sitting in an office, a uh, serviced office downtown in Brisbane that I cannot get to anymore. Um, it's been isolated out, one of those buildings and we're not allowed into without uh, specific permission and those sorts of things. So I'm sitting at home on a stool having this session off uh, a laptop that I have at home. So let's move forward. This is why it's a good thing to, to talk about fast tracking, uh, Shadow Protect SBX and I'm going to talk about Image Manager and a little bit, tiny little bit about Shadow Control, about what we can do. So. For those who have not seen SBX before, I am picking on my domain controller here. This is SBX and I am going to make a bit of a song and dance about versions here, folks. Uh, it's pretty tough to see. Not virtual box, Jack, you silly little man. This is SBX version 684. Um, Please speak with your support people, your account managers. 684 is the current latest version. Uh, very solid, very sound. 2012 R2 um, and below it works like a champion. Um, you can see some of the smarts in behind it already. If you have a look just up here, checking volumes and image chains. That's something Shadow Protect never ever did, folks. And so. It, it basically, this is a 64-bit version, obviously. Uh, Shadow Protect was always 32-bit. What I like about this particular version of SBX, or any version of SBX for that matter, 674, is every 10 minutes, give or take, a second or three, it will go out and test the image repository. So you can see here I'm backing up across the network, which is a local network down to my host and it goes out and checks as you saw there a second ago it goes out and checks do I have an image repository yes I do the next second thing it says can I write to it and it actually writes a small file there and you'll see a temporary file turn up if you're quick enough you will see a small temporary file turn up and I go yeah I can can I read from there and then it will actually delete that file if it can and it goes beauty the second thing it will do, or the next thing it does, is it says, do I have a valid shortest pass chain? Now, why is this so important? It's so important that it actually is checking this chain because what happens if ransomware gets in there, it's going to go, well, I can't use that chain, so I better create for myself a brand new base, and it will automatically do it, okay? If the whole chain's corrupt, it'll actually automatically create one. Now, if it's only because a file is corrupted in there or some somebody's inadvertently deleted the file, it would automatically just do a differential. Okay? But it checks. It has a valid shortest path chain, which is really extremely important because Shadow Protect only ever used to check the last incremental and the base. It never cared if there was nothing in between proved that 100,000 times. This thing actually tests everything. And then it does something that Shadow Protect never ever did. It actually goes and says, on average here, and if you have a click back through some of these things, you know, there's a thousand, it's not even a meg in size that back up. So what's this one? Nine meg. This one, 
to me. And it actually does a summary and says, well, on average, I'm going to need, what's this one here? Nine meg again. So let's say on average, I'm going to need 10 meg. And it says, how much free space do I have on that image repository? And it comes back and says, oh, you still got, you know, 600 gig. And it goes, oh, okay, I've got plenty of space. And it works out all of those things and basically says to SP Run when it, when it fires off, yeah, mate, we're good to go. You don't have to do anything special, okay? But SP Run's then going to go and do another check for itself. Otherwise, it will report via whatever mechanism that I've got a fundamental problem. And so how many people, me included, actually go into notification settings for here, all right? and set anything up. I don't bother with notification settings. I don't really need to anymore. Why? Because I use this. Okay, I use shadow control, folks. It needs to become part and parcel of your monitoring process because who wants to monitor 20,000 emails a day? I don't. I'm flat out dealing with you know, the 250 I get a day from other things. So, why is SPX such an important part of our, our lives these days? It is sector-based backups, folks. It's never changed. We don't back up files, all right? This is a fast track thing. We do not back up files. We back up the sectors the file sits on. So each and every one of these backups here that you see is the change sectors per volume because I've got both volumes in the same job. All right, these are the sectors that have changed since the previous backup. And you'll see here that I'm doing them every 30 minutes. So let's have a quick look at the job. I just hit the edit button. And you'll see here I'm backing up the C drive and the page file. I'll talk about this other little animal down here in a second. I'm using RC4 128-bit encryption. Why am I doing that? It's the smallest overhead. It has not yet been cracked. We've had some of the best hackers, ethical hackers, try to crack that encryption. We gave them a base backup of a machine. Well, it wasn't real big. And we gave them four characters out of the password. This is what the states did a few years, quite a few years ago now. And they said to the ethical hackers, here's 10 grand. See if you can hack it. They gave them the four, first four characters of the password, and they were capital P at SS. And you know what they did. They tried everything, this side of the black stump, and they couldn't get it, all right? So RC4 128-bit encryption is the fastest encryption, less overhead, and I don't want to have to have my CPUs overloaded in any manner, so I still use that. And obviously you put the password in, and we create the key file. That key file is important in my opinion. I'll show you what that key file looks like, folks. Uh, sorry, wrong place, please forgive me. The key file is stored where the backups are stored. So I'll go down to here where the backups are stored and I'll go into the uh, domain controller here and that's the key file, all right? You can open up this key file with Notepad or in my case, Programmers++ plus, uh, plus plus or whatever you want to call it. And it makes an awful lot of sense to all of us, doesn't it? It's all binary. You can't do much with it, so it's... It is what it is. All right, so now we'll go back to here. Okay, so the schedule. Now I've set up my schedules, folks, and please, you know, it's all about backing up change sectors from a certain time to a certain time. And the default now is like five minutes past eight o'clock of the morning. Uh, so a server doesn't get, get active before eight o'clock in the morning, folks, seriously. The default is obviously 8 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night, and Sunday and Saturday are not selected. Please do me a favour. Um, have you ever watched, and I make a joke out of this thing, have you ever stood around at 6 o'clock at night and watched your servers walk out the door and go home for the weekend? They don't do that. They still sit there. So I tick Sunday and I tick Saturday and I go at 2 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. I do have a little bit of a break in the middle. Uh, why? Because I don't particularly want to overload the server that's doing the image manager role. I don't want more backups turning up at that time. Hopefully that's enough time, but irrelevant. 
for a couple of small servers, you know, that three hour period is enough time for it to sort itself out. You can obviously run it every 15 minutes. I think that's overkill. And I also disagree with people saying, well, I'm only going to do one backup a day. And they just have the same time there. Well, you're shortchanging yourself. At an hour, I think you're shortchanging yourself. Why? Um, comes down to one very simple, simple question. This is a domain controller, folks, and my background was always Active Directory Disaster Recovery, Exchange, and some SQL Disaster Recovery. Okay, I wasn't an expert on the SQL one, but the uh, AD and Exchange was my bread and butter for many years. Did you know, if you've got your AD set up correctly, that every half an hour, a server, be it this SQL box that I have hiding, lurking around in the background here somewhere, this SQL server here will talk to this DC every 30 minutes and go, g'day, or hello, or konnichiwa, or whatever the language you want to speak, it's irrelevant to me, Chinese, um, whatever, okay? It says hello to the domain controller. What is the purpose of that hello? The purpose of that hello is to say I'm still here, I'm still in Active Directory, update my USN number. It's as simple as that. And people say you don't need to back up domain controllers. If you want to read a really interesting story about how stupid some people can be, look up Maersk Shipping Company Disaster. They lost their entire Active Directory structure four days. It took 45 minutes for a ransomware to take out their worldwide shipping operations. Just blew them out of the water. There was captains on these super container ships heading across the Pacific Ocean going, I know I'm going to San Francisco, but I have no idea what's on this boat anymore. Not a clue. It was all the computers were taken out. And they were told, throw the computers overboard because we're not going to bring them back onto the domain. Crunch, munch, lots. Back up your domain controller, folks. Back them up every half an hour, please. Change the replication time on the domain controllers to every half an hour. Every 15 minutes if you want. Please do it. It's not much to change. It's not much traffic. But back the damn things up, including Saturday and Sunday, because what's the point of backing them up on, the, on Friday? Some turkey comes in and cryptos the joint, and you're trying to restore back to Friday, and all of a sudden, because the other thing is servers change and computers change their domain password every five days, give or take a day. What's the point of having to pull a whole bunch of servers and computers back out of the domain and put them back in the domain because you didn't back them up over the weekend? You want to fast track how technical information was Shadow Protect? That is one of the most important things you can do. So bear that one in mind, folks. All right, if you have further questions about that, contact anybody in Storagecraft and they'll forward something on to me and I, I can ring you and have you have a conversation with you about that. If, if you learn nothing today, that's the critical part. Uh, in the advanced tab over here, folks, um, you got a lot of fancy bits and pieces in here. You can't even see the bottom of the screen. I'll try to drag it up a little bit further. Um, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. The two most important things I can say to you, particularly with 6.8 series, it will tell you that this writer has failed. Okay. Whereas in 674, it would never tell you that this writer continues to fail. All right. The simple way is, you know, you can go down the path of a whole bunch of Microsoft, you know, fixes and whatever. This thing's failed since 2003. So all I'm simply saying is untick this box and unselect that ASR writer. It does something for us, so get rid of it. And then keep this one here. Okay. Use right caching when saving image files, okay? Use that to back up across the network to make sure my network is working as good as I can possibly get it. It handles 
issues where potentially I am not using the right network driver, I'm not getting my Intel card talking to a 3Com network uh, switch, all those types of things, that will help me overcome those technical problems where Intel and, and HP don't want to talk at any layer, even business-wise, face-to-face, they don't want to talk correctly with each other. So it's important that you tick this one and leave it ticked. It used to be for troubleshooting, but I'm saying just forget about that. This one here is all greyed out because I am using um, over here continuous uh, incrementals. Okay, so it's custom continuous. All right. Now, why did I not select this? Because it's uh, really a waste of time. It's um, it's whole concept for system reserve on an MBR server or a GPT server. Okay, is the M this system reserve petition is used for. Um, BitLocker encryption. All right. So if I was, if this particularly, if this was a uh, a physical machine and I turned on BitLocker, um, I would tick that box because if I had to do a restore, I need to know what the password is to the BitLocker, and then I can restore stuff because my disk is locked at the OS at the BIOS level, and then I restore it. But if I'm restoring it to any other computer, that system reserve petition is absolutely useless to me. And so the trick to it is, is I don't normally back it up. Even if it's going back to the same machine, I don't back it up. I just restore the, in this case, the C and the E drive. And then when I've got the system booted, I go and turn off BitLocker. And it goes, oh, okay, fine, reboot. I then log back in and I turn on BitLocker. All right. And BitLocker will then go if the 100 meg, or in this case, 350 meg, if the 350 meg partition doesn't exist at the front, it will take it from the back end of the C drive and say, well, I'm going to make my system reserve partition back there, and that's where the encryption algorithm is going to sit, the key sits, and it'll create it for itself and ask for another reboot, and away it'll go. So if you're using BitLocker, don't stress, Windows could fix it for you. It's not a problem. So I don't normally back those up. There is no reason to back them up because nine times out of ten you're going to a different machine and you definitely don't want to cause yourself a problem. So I do not back them up for that reason. You can't put them back down on another machine if you're using BitLocker. So I don't do it. As a principle, I just don't do it. Uh, I'd rather deal with it another way because it gets confusing. Oh, should I or shouldn't I? Half the people that own some of these machines, they don't even know the password for the BitLocker part. So you just sort of go, you know what, not interested. Let's restore what we know, how we know, and we'll deal with the BitLocker afterwards. Okay, so that's the trick. Okay, schedule, all right, understand what I'm doing here. All right, continuous incrementals, and we're done. At the sector level, I'm backing up both drives here in the same job, okay? Uh, you can click save, you can click cancel. Now, why did I do both jobs, uh, both volumes in the same job? Uh, old habit of mine, whenever I build a domain controller, my Active Directory never sits on the C drive. I've got a second drive. It's not a volume, uh, it's not a volume on the same physical disk or virtual disk. It is a second virtual disk and I've always put AD on the second disk because back in the days when we were running the first of Active Directory on a Windows 2000 box, um, we had MacStore was the brand to go with in those days. MacStore SCSI hard drives. Um, SATA hard drives actually today run quicker than those poor old Mac stores did. So. We did that as a thing of principle to make them run. Microsoft's recommendation for us back then, they actually gave us a tool to work out disk I.O., how many disks were you changing or that you were changing. And so when we did the, the first rollouts in Brisbane, um, we just set up, we'll put a second hard drive in, not even mirrored by the way, 
we put a second hard drive in and we put AD on that as part of the install of Active Directory. And so folks, there we go. Quick, easy, whatever. Now some other things that I will say to you, um, always create your destinations in isolation. What do I mean by that? Please do your destination first. Do not try to do the destination as part of a backup wizard. Particularly with Windows 10, Windows 2016 and Windows 2019. I have seen too many instances of people doing that wizard that way and then when they reboot it comes up and says I've got no destination. Why? Because Windows 2016, Windows 10 and 2019 write caching says, yeah, I've written that to disk and because it makes a decision, Windows write caching makes the decision to say, yeah, yeah, I've still got that stored somewhere. Um, I haven't yet written it to disk, it's fine. And then you do a reboot and it goes, uh, what was I supposed to write to disk? I've seen it happen on more occasions than not. So please remember to do that in isolation and it forces it to write to disk because then you move on to the next part. If you do it as part of the wizard, it has about a 10% chance that it may not write it to disk. And I don't like taking 10% you know, to me is too high of an opportunity for something to get missed. So that's where we're at with that one. And apart from that, the only other uh, thing that I would uh, uh, highlight to you is once you've got this configured and set, please close this and forget. Okay? Don't open it again. There is no need to open it. There should never be a need to modify anything inside of that. I see an awful lot of people open this up and keep it open. You will have an STC Uh, STC, uh, sorry, SVC host memory issue. Okay, it'll leak because this thing's talking uh, SBX service, uh, this service here, which is the main service that this console talks to. Sorry. That's the main service there. It's the one that this console talks to. This one then calls um, vSnap, that one. And that one there is the one that does the job, obviously. It's the provider that we call. But the SBX service, um, this console talks to that and then it talks to you know a few other bits and pieces. You end up with a SVC host memory leak and it can possibly bind up the machine. So I have a tendency to not run. I recommend to a lot of people, please do not leave this console open. Set it and forget it. Okay? Now, what should we do to help us protect the shadow protect from RDP hackers? Obviously, Obviously, we should not be doing RDP port forwards, okay? Um, obviously, we shouldn't be doing RP, uh, uh, RDP port forwards in any way, shape or form. Something else that you can investigate, and I've done this in quite a few places, is you can come into uh, program files, all right, and you can come into storage craft, you can come into the SBX, this folder, and you can see where it's uh, in the security part here. Um, it's got users that have a read and execute. You can take that out. You can also take out administrators if you want to, and I've done that for a certain number of people, system must remain, but I can add in a specific local user because this is a domain controller, I don't have that ability, but I could in, add in some obscure account in here and give them full control only, 
that then stops other domain administrators from getting in here, which is how hackers normally get in, and I can just use this one account, and then I can make that service not run as a local system, but as this particular administrator. Okay, so there are some tips and tricks we can give you to stop rogue uh, hackers from getting in by RDP to try and take over this thing, and I've seen them delete your, they find out where your backups are being backed up to, they then go and delete the current backups, they then delete the current backup job, they create their own backup job, um, and then go and throw a whole bunch of encryption over everything and all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff, and yeah, left in a bit of a mess, so you need to try to protect yourself as best you can. Um, there is a white paper, of course, that I've written around ransomware, how to protect your destinations. So please, so please um, you know, ask for that if you would like it. It is important that we protect our destinations. Um, so that's SBX part. What I would like to spend a couple of minutes on is where those images are backed up to. So I'll just minimise this again and I'll minimise these two machines. Um, just drag this little girl over here. That's my SQL server. That's part and parcel of this little um, environment. That obviously is the files that I'm using. Um, they're the files that are being backed up obviously, or have they are the backup files. I'd uh, just like to draw your attention to fast tracking this, and I know I'm getting close to time folks, but I think this is important. This particular version of Image Manager is 7.6. Why would I like to bang on about this one? This one's pretty cool. Really cool actually. Um, it looks the same as every other version you've ever seen. Okay. It has. All right, if you have a look at the, oh sorry, we're going to have a look at the replication. I've got these servers being replicated um, to our cloud, um, as you can see. Oh, sorry, that's my workstation. Uh, not that. There's the cloud backups. You can see the retention. And you can see in agent settings, all right, you can see the performance. I've got my timing set. My performance is set. I will quickly highlight this. If you have maximum managed folders processed simultaneously more than one, please change it now. Unless you, if you, if you're using an SMB connection, change it now because it will kill the server and it will get further and further and further behind. Global retention. I've said this because it's only me that I have to worry about. They're not good settings for normal business. Um, I can send you a document about what are good settings. Um, I'm going to go into quite a bit of detail with that. Locations here, I've got uh, UNC path, I've got cloud, and basically it tells me what version I'm running. Will be, there's nothing there that sort of excites us. But I am going to show you what does excite me on this particular one. Been a long time coming, but it's worth the wait. This doesn't look any different to anything else, okay? I have a different password for these backups for my workstation that I do for the other two. So I've set that password here. It will go global password, local managed folder password, or key file. So here I've set it in here. Um, retention is, I've just automatically accepted it, but verification, there's a really nice cool feature here. We've had this one for a while, advanced, ensure newly consolidated image files successfully boot. Um, I used to tick the box that says, show me a picture of this machine booted up. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool, but not a guarantee. Nothing in IT is guaranteed, but I like this one. Check volume integrity of newly consolidated image files. This one is pretty cool. And I'll open up Outlook and show you why I think it's pretty cool. Okay, it'll be open up the background, folks. It's got a lot of email in it at the moment. This one is really cool because it's doing a check disk against a mounted collapse daily. A check disk against a mounted 
file system. So it's actually double checking the primary and the secondary file allocation tables against the actual sectors sitting on this mounted image in read-only format. I'm telling you that's the best check you can ever get. It tells me that there's nothing wrong with the file allocation table on this particular computer, server, whatever. And more interestingly, because I ran a performance check against it, more interestingly, uh, very little performance hit at all. And so all we're going to do here now is uh, a few of these people are wishing me a birthday, trying to remind me I'm a little old. No, I'm not. I'm only 46 and I'm dyslexic today. Said that to somebody the other day and they looked at me strange. I'm actually 64 today, gentlemen. But that's okay. It'll come up here in a second. Here we go. Look at this. This is the email you get from that machine. Image manager on Windows 10 verified. Check this verified. The C drive. Uh, 10,409 collapsed daily, no errors were found. And it tells me the version of check this that ran top of the file system, volume lady, uh, F parameter not specified, running check desk in read only mode. And you can see the next uh, couple of thousand, it <laughs> feels like a couple of thousand, but the next 10 to 20 lines. And it's gone repass points, it's examining security descriptors, it's, it's pretty in depth, isn't it, folks? Okay, and so if you look at this, um, this is one of the best checks that you will ever get. This warms my little old heart, this does, because it's a disaster recovery sort of bloke, bloke that has to go and find out, you know, all the things that have gone wrong for people and whatever else. If you show me this, okay, and here's the one for the DC, all right. That's the one I'm sending to the cloud. Uh, so that's the C drive for the DC. This one's the E drive for the DC where AD sits. Okay. No errors were found. And then it'll go through and do my SQL box. And there's five drives, SQL box, separate volumes. And I'm doing them all in the same job at the moment, but I'm going to split that up again one day. But look at it. All you've got to do is look for no errors were found. Now I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the only person, the only thing that's going to stop me from restoring these machines is me. Not our software, not the hardware or the virtualized environment we're going to use, but me. So am I tickle big about that? You're not wrong. There's a whole bunch of other things in this version of Image Manager, folks, that is important as well. Okay. I can't stress strongly enough, folks, get all of your machines, tell all your workmates, tell all your competitors, tell all your, your, your associates as, as, as you meet them socially, well, you can't meet anybody socially these days, but you know, as you're talking with people over the, over the internet, 7.6 Image Manager is well worth the exercise. It is well worth it, if for nothing, than this. It is brilliant. It is absolutely top-notch, okay? Absolutely top-notch. So fast-track technical boot camp on SPX. I could not miss the opportunity to talk about the image manager as well. And one final thing so that you're well and truly aware, folks, is these cloud replication jobs. Um, they don't look any different from what we had before. Okay, they don't look any different from what we've had before. They look exactly the same, except down at this level here, we are not using, uh, bear with me, eyeballs are getting a little lazy on me. I've got to get past all this. We are all used to seeing those two files there, or this particular file. That's what we used to use as the default FTP library to upload. We are now using this one, the Chillcat one. 
Chilcats over here is talk about Chilcat as as compared to the EDT FTP net one. The Chilcat one is uh, quicker. Uh, in my particular environment, I noticed a uh, three times improvement out of my serviced office environment. Uh, some people are seeing double, some other people are seeing better than that. Uh, there's not one user that hasn't seen an improvement by using this Chilcat one. How they do it, I don't know. I have no idea, but that is one of the other reasons why uh, it's important, in my opinion, uh, to switch over to to 7.6 as well. Look, there's a bunch of other fixes. You can go and read the readme about it. You can learn all about them. Um, whatever. The fixes and features of 7.6, I cannot stop yelling about them from the top of the tower. It's just beautiful. So, any further ado, I'm going to go to the questions and see what questions we've got. Um, Jason says good morning. And then Shamal said, well, happy, happy birthday again. Stop reminding me I'm getting old, fellas. And see ya. Thanks, mate. You're beautiful. Um, Craig saying, young fella. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what happens if the server needed? Uh, what happens if the server needed to? Oops. Hang on a minute. What's going on here? If the server needed to be shut down with the power off process. I think Samal's asking me a question here is, and forgive me Shamal if I've, I've missed this, if I'm halfway through replicating a file to the cloud or file to an FTP, so let's go and have a quick look here at, at, at um, I'll go here and we'll go create a job and we'll go replication. And so these are the replication options I've got, local drive being a USB or whatever, network could be a UNC uh, to a server to a NAS box, intelligent FTP could be to anywhere, um, you know, customers uh, FTP server at home, it could be to a partner's FTP server, um, whatever, shadow stream in Australia we will not sell unless you have a specific reason like line of sight um, line of sight the microwave link or something over a distance um, there's the only reason we would ever sell it um, I try to avoid it like the plague if I can because it's treated as a UDP transfer mechanism and most Cisco and well, most of the high-end routers today will treat it as UDP storm and block it. So it's not something we would do. Uh, the Amazon S3 compatible storage is if you want to send up a chain for a seven-year retention process. It's pretty cool, folks. It's pretty cool. There's a lot of fixes we've done to that in this particular version. So it's a, it's a way of you making a few bucks. It's a way of you saying to a customer, I can keep your base you consolidate monthly files for seven years in a S3 compatible storage. Do not speak at all about blobs and blobs and glacier and all that sort of far out shit that is S3. It has to be S3 because we do not need to do re-verifications at all. And then obviously cloud services, right? Now, the, the, the interesting thing here is, and I've tested this, um, just recently I had a replication happening to one of my servers by FTP um, and I was replicating the base of a different machine, um, this actual underlying machine that I'm sitting on right here. So if you have a look at this particular machine, um, 
you can see some sizes of data sets sitting on this thing. It's pretty big. And I got halfway through it and I thought, ah, oh, damn it, I need to take the machine because I had to go to a meeting. So I um, was actually going away for four days, uh, or so I thought, and wasn't going to come back. So I shut the servers down and I shut the laptop down, disappeared to an appointment and was able to fix a problem in like 10 minutes. So I went back to the office and turned the server back on and turned on my laptop and they'd been obviously down and hadn't been communicating for two hours and like there was a bit of drive and had a bit of lunch on the way back and then whatever but when uh, when they fired back up the little buggers started replicating from exactly the same point as they left off at exactly the same sector from where they left off because the communication happened that said well before Jack rudely shut us down, we, I was up to sector number such and such, and the server said, "Well, I was, I had sector such and such as a packet transfer," and they said, "Right, just just be safe. How about we go back one?" And basically, it took off from where it left off. So power out is not a problem, Shmuel, ever. Okay, it's pretty clever the way it does it. So it's it's pretty cool. Okay. That's why I like it, particularly this one now too. It, it deals with some replication to the cloud in a much smarter fashion than we've been doing. Um, and the cloud can actually now talk to this version of Image Manager without any interruption or intervention by support, knock or anything. And the cloud can actually say to this one here, like this one here, and it can say, hey, listen, I need this file because the one I got I think is damaged. Can you resend it? And this one will go, yeah, sure, no worries. And it'll just send it up. We don't have to get involved anymore. And that to me is a good thing. So they've done a huge amount of work on trying to make this thing significantly more reliable and added that really cool feature in. So I think that's a, a, a big win for all of us. Shamal, you asking these questions, mate. You know, we'll answer this one. What happens in a dirty shutdown and the power comes on two hours later? Because the first thing you're going to do, Shamal, is uh, ask one of your resellers to go and sell this particular customer a UPS. It's the first thing you're going to do. The second thing you're going to do is, if a server shuts down in a dirty state, image manager obviously is not going to stress about that it will just deal with its problems. However, what's going to happen from the SPX side of things is that if a file, um, I'll do it this way. When we shut down a server in a graceful or a computer, anything, doesn't really matter. When we shut them down in a graceful manner, uh, our our core driver called STCVSM has to flush out what sector changes are still in memory and that's called VDIF and you see it all through our log files, VDIF. Um, VDIF is where we store, it's a bitmap file stored in kernel memory. Uh, there's a whole hour session talking about VDIF if you wanted but VDIF basically is where we record the STCVSM sector changes. All right, so VDIF has to be in a graceful shutdown written somewhere and so that's where we write this. Okay. Now you can see that on my C drive of this particular machine, vsm 0 dx file has a date of this. Okay. I can show you some servers where the date of that, and I know they've had reboots, could be two years ago. Because they're a mechanical disk, it's quite likely that the time service has definitely been shut down but the file has still been written too so you don't stress about the date stamp that's on that file but that's where we write that stuff too so in a dirty shutdown where you walk up and just pull a power cable out of it all right the vdiff has not been written into that vsm 0idx file 
And so what's that, what has to happen is SVX will then mount the current chain, pull out the file allocation table out of the chain and it will verify that the primary one and the secondary one agree with each other. It will then go to the one on the physical disk, physical or virtual disk, let's just call it the disk, and it will say, right, what's the difference between you two turkeys? And it will hammer the disk like there's no tomorrow to find out the difference between the backup file allocation table, the disk file allocation table, and will back up the sectors that are different, excluding obviously the page file, um, and write that down as a backup. Now that differential on a large server, I've seen some take a week, and I've seen some take 20 minutes. It all depends on how big the drive is and everything else, so I try like hell to to make sure people don't do that because it can be right raw painful to do a differential, okay? So I try to avoid them like the plague. I, I'll go out of my way to say, please don't do that. Let's see if we can find another way, okay? See if we can find another way to bring this server back so we don't have to do a dirty shutdown. It's just not one of those things that you want to wish on anybody because if you've got an underlying disk issue, you could end up with major problems. And on really big servers sometimes is quicker to do a, a brand new base than it is to do a differential. So that's what happens and we need to be real careful if you're replicating to the cloud when a differential turns up. Uh, is there ways around it? Sure, talk to us and I'll show you a way around it. Um, but we just need to be careful, that's all. Okay. This one's from Craig, and I'll just read it out so we're all aware of what the thing is. Image Manager 7.6, very encouraging to see storage. Finally continuing to develop this. Have they provided options for better handling replication of very large images? to stop them holding up smaller images? Um, Craig, the short answer is no. Um, the long game, long term gain or game here that I'm trying to in get them to introduce is the concept of not two queues but two threads of the same queue so that we might have you know, this one big big file with that somebody's stupidly gone and added um, their iTunes library to the file server and we know what sort of issues that can cause. Um, so while we're trying to replicate that particular incremental or that collapsed daily up, there's still all these little small incrementals of the OS partition sitting there that we want to get up there as well. And so we're, what we're trying to do is get them to realise that it's the same server. And I don't want to hold up the backups of that server getting to the cloud because the, some of the older image managers have proven that if you hold up the replication of some of those drives for long enough, image manager forgets about them and might replicate them. Now that's been fixed in this one, but why the hell can't we introduce the problem, the issue, uh, sorry, introduce the feature of, well, how about I have two threads in the same thread or two replication queues in the same queue and say, well, I'm doing nothing else except trying to get this one over here and while our replication and, and queues and, and bandwidth has improved, why can't I just while I'm still doing this big one, why can't I just pick the C drive ones and go, you send them up too, all right? So that I can keep the C drive and the D drive up to date while I'm still trying to shove this big one up. So we're trying to uh, 
that is a feature request we've put in and hopefully because they've realised that the newer products are not going to be the end all be all of everything, um, they realise that they're going to have to uh, maintain these properly. They got came to that realisation uh, late last year and so SBX, Image Manager, um, even FBR, file, uh, file Backup and Recovery, um, it's also getting a revamp. They're, they're definitely working on some fixes for Cloud Backup for Office 365 um, and Cloud Services. They're doing a lot of work in that area because they realise that you know that's got to be done. And so, yes. But if you've got further feature requests, just send them to one of your either your SE or your your account manager and say, hey, I'd like this included, and we'll just put them through. More than happy to back it up. Okay. Sorry, this one here, I just need to read this. Um, two seconds, please. Uh, see ya. <clears throat> For Image Manager 7.6, if we right click on the replication job, there is replication time check. Does it mean Image Manager will perform check disk on the other side? Um, There, yeah, talk, talk to me. Hang on a minute. I'll expand this out. Just two seconds. See ya. See ya. You can speak, mate. I'm not quite sure of your question. Hi, Jack. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Can, can you just like close down this uh, cloud uh, replication to cloud services uh, and choose the other one, the top one, replicate? Back of images that one. and yeah, and just do a right click on it, and uh, uh, no, just uh, close it up. Then there's a replication image. Just right, uh, just do a right click. The second last uh, replicate image. Yeah. So I'm pleased that there's a like time check uh, on the other side. Does it mean that it would do the the same like check this once the backup image have been replicated to other side? Are you talking about this one here? Yeah. Now that's a resync. So that's a UNC path, that one. If you have a look at the properties of this one, that's a UNC path that I'm using. I'm sending images from this machine up to this machine, testing the NUC theory out, um, testing it to the to the extreme, I guess. That's a NUC that I set up as a BDR. Um, that's all that is. If you have a look at the cloud one, uh, you can go into here and you can also do the cloud one and you can actually say to the cloud one, you know, I can do a resync from here, which is a new feature in this particular model as well, which um, I've not seen before either, but that's one of the newer features that there's so many new features in this thing. If you were to sit there and read the readme for this thing, it would take, mm, I don't know, features between the features and bugs, you'd probably be sitting there for a good half an hour reading everything. So that one there is something that they've put in place so that you can actually do a resync. You just hit the resync and, and it'll just go and say, right, what do you got that you shouldn't have? 
um, and what are you missing? And so one of the reasons I just keep, and I, and I know I've said it, people are getting sick in Australia of hearing me say this, but if you're not on 7.6, I'm not going to help you. It's as simple as that, see ya? Get on 7.6 and a lot of your problems will disappear. They seriously will. Okay? Okay. Thanks, Jack. No worries. Douglas is asking a question here. Mr. How you can make this bloody thing bigger? Um, Douglas, bear with me. Check volume integrity. Can we only get emails if errors are detected? Can that resend occur with, oh, no, no, Douglas is asking too. You can't have two questions, Douglas. I mean, you know. So I'll ask the first one. Um, oh, no, he's, he did separate them. That's cool. Check volume integrity. Can we only get emails if errors are detected at this point um, of time, Douglas? Um, I would dearly love to say to you that um, if I was in here, there's an update coming for shadow control. While in shadow control right now, I can go to push installs. And this was updated the day they did the public release. So I can go, uh, I'm going to update SBX, all right, and I'm going to go for you know, whatever version. Um, I can't update. I'm on the wrong one. That's why. Sorry, folks. Basically, the day they released SBX uh, and Shadow uh, Image Manager 7.6, you could push install those two versions without a problem. What they haven't yet done, and that is coming um, this month, is in the next month, uh, the, in, in May, they're pushing out an update for Shadow Control where they can then report on those check disk errors in this interface, okay? So that will be, and it'll be just another option that will be here, so if there are check disk errors, they will suck them straight out of the event logs and stick them straight into here. So that is uh, in May. I'm expecting that update based on the roadmap that I've been given. So um, emails are the only way at the moment. Worst luck. Um, but <coughs> we can get them. Um, depends too on what RMM tool you've got. Um, RMM tools, they have updated the ConnectWise one so that you don't need emails. It'll just pull it straight out of ConnectWise and pull it straight out of the uh, event logs. Okay, so um, I'm not sure about the rest of them. So I uh, know it's not the answer you wanted, but it's the best I can give you. Uh, the FTP, uh, Douglas has asked his second question, can that resend occur with FTP? Um, replication. Um, to be totally honest with you, Douglas, I have not tested it myself um, with FTP replication. Hang on two more seconds. Hang on two more seconds. If I go to this machine, I'm just up opening up another image manager, mate, that's going to give us another view. This one is on the, my Alien machine, which all this other stuff is running on. Uh, it's confusing, I know. Uh, this one should be 7.6, and it is so. And this one is replicating to, uh, it's the only machine that's sitting on this, so I'm backing the Alien up to a, to a device on it. And it's replicating to a FileZilla server in my network and replicated images, and so yes, there you are. There's your answer. Absolutely. So thanks for forcing me to have a look for myself. How do we easily update our image manager from the latest version? Can we just install over the top with 7.6? Um, 
absolutely, just straight over the top. You can use uh, Shadow Control to do the update for you if you want. Um, you can use any RMM tool you've got and that's fine. You'll just go straight over the top and should be done. Um, it may ask you for a reboot is the only thing because it's using the latest <coughs> mini filter driver to do the mounting. It probably will never ask you for that again. But yes, you can go straight over the top. Okay. I would strongly advise, however, that um, I've, this one's still open so I can use this one. Uh, there's image manager gone. If you've got a job running, like I've got three replication jobs running, I would strongly, strongly advise you to pause those jobs um, before you do the upgrade. If you've got a HSR job happening, pause it. I would just pause the jobs. It just takes the stress out of the little tiny database that we use, takes the stress out of image manager, just pause all jobs. Uh, then do the upgrade, do the reboot, and when you get, when it comes back up, um, just release the jobs and you're good to go. It's just a standard practice for myself that I would do that. Um, there are some other things under certain circumstances you might would like to do, um, but basically I pause the jobs on every. I would strongly recommend that pause the jobs and just move forward. Okay. Um, we got a few questions coming up here now. Even on a graceful shutdown, a diff can be generated. Can we clear a file? Um, even on a graceful shutdown, a diff can. Generate. Can we clear a file? I'm going to have to do this. Sorry, Douglas. I don't quite understand the question, mate. So just bear with me while I find your name on our list here. Douglas, uh, I've um, uh, opened up your microphone so that if you have a microphone you can speak, please. Um, one of your questions has got me just a little um, baffled. You've got here, even on a graceful shutdown, a diff can be generated. Can we clear a file to... Um, if Douglas, can you hear me or can you speak? I'll, I'll wait till I hear from you. If I don't hear from you, what I'm going to do is I have got two cases in Australia where a Windows 2016 server, and there's a really strange story to this one, so I've got two 2016 servers sitting on top of a Windows 2016 Hyper-V server. One of them is a relatively small terminal server. It gets gracefully shut down, not a problem. It starts up, no differential at all. The other one is quite a heavily loaded um, SQL file server domain controller. Um, if I was to give it an average number, I'm going to say seven times out of ten. When it's gracefully shut down, it doesn't write the IDX file out, and because of a uh, it, so when obviously it gets restarted, at least two of the four volumes have to do a differential, and that differential is a right raw pain because it is very disk intensive on these two, guests, uh, sorry, this one guest. And what we found was it wasn't so much the guest 
being a pain, it was the host that was the pain because it would never been updated. It didn't, it didn't have the Windows Server Stack updates on it. It also had a Windows drivers on the host, didn't have the Dell drivers and wasn't up to date for the firmware. So once we got all that part sorted out, this thing started to behave. One of the biggest issues we were up against was um, Windows 16, you cannot, and I've trust me, I've tried, you cannot turn off write caching. And so what was happening was because the underlying disk subsystem was sluggish, I mean they were SAS hard drives, literally, and the ones for the OSs were actually sitting on um, SSDs, but because they were so sluggish, the right caching Windows 2016 says, yep, so I've written those things to disk and telling the OS it was safe to shut down, when in actual fact it wasn't writing them to disk. And it took us weeks to prove that. When we finally proved it, we sort of we sort of updated everything and, and whatever, and we got one of them back up and running. The other one, um, I'm still in this sort of situation where I, I know what's wrong, I just can't stop it. And it's a Windows 2016 thing. So I hope that sort of gives you some sort of an idea, Douglas. Um, keep things updated, particularly Windows 2016 and 19. Keep the hosts, if it's Hyper-V, and all guests, keep them updated with the server stack updates from Windows because if you don't, you're going to end up with something underneath that is rather sluggish. And the server stack update is the I.O. stack. That's what it comes down to. Um, I've proved that in at least two occasions now that that's a problem. So I hope that gives you some guidance, Douglas. Um, if not, mate, ask for my phone number from your account manager and we can have a conversation. Uh, Shamal, uh, I don't want to go into shadow control too much today, mate. If you want, we can do a private session because this thing's supposed to last like uh, 35 to 45 minutes and I've already taken up well over an hour already of people's time so I can show you that later. This one here is from Douglas again. If the, if the cloud finds an error in an image, it can request that file again. Absolutely, in 7.6. Yeah, uh, 7.6, it will it will ask, and 7.6 will honour that request, where some of the earlier versions didn't. Can we get image manager to do the same in FTP replication? Uh, no, Douglas, because the destination is not through image manager. It's traditionally through an FTP server, so FTP. Um, would have to sort of do that for us. So that's why they've introduced that other other bit, I guess. But no, we can't deal with the FTP servers like that, mate. I'm sorry. Can we do anything to bypass the differential check? No, not at all. Not at all. Once it's, once it's been triggered, to do a differential, there is nothing that can happen because basically what you're asking it to do is to say, well, the file system's corrupted, shit, who cares, let's just continue on. That won't happen. Uh, that won't happen at all. Douglas, it just can't happen. Okay, folks, um, I'm going to have to call it there. So thank you very much for your time today. I uh, hope you've got something out of today and one of the major things that I'm trying to achieve today is fast tracking you a little bit. Used properly with these things and I can send you out a whole bunch of white papers that we have. I've got a bunch of them about all these things and a lot more detail. The beauty of it is this stuff is like three miles away from me in an office I can't get to. 
but I can set up all of this stuff remotely. I can then replicate it to the clouds remotely and I can put in place business continuity plans for all my customers. You know, these are my works, my own sort of service stuff, but over the last two, three weeks I've helped about 12 partners do such things to get stuff off-prem because people are starting to realise uh, what happens if I have a business continuity problem? Well, you need to get the stuff off-site. So that's one of the reasons we're all talking here today about this sort of stuff. Fast tracking our knowledge so that how the hell do I get it off-site and then get it off-site. So thank you very much for your time folks. Um, be safe, stay safe and look after yourself folks. You are important to us all, every one of you. You're important to your families.